Seamus Ennis Arts Centre first opened its doors in 2001. In memory of the great piper Seamus Ennis, the centre aims to commemorate his work in the performance, archiving and promotion of Irish music. Through concerts, workshops, education, festivals, media and other events, the centre provides a platform where works by those whose mastery and love of Irish arts can be explored and their contribution to their art forms safeguarded and made accessible to future generations. On a May evening in 1943, after a number of failed attempts, Seamus Ennis finally met a man suggested to him as Dinna Ella a Willora Nigge, just another person who has songs. But this meeting was to be the beginning of a lifelong friendship between the collector and the man who gave him more songs, tunes and culture than anyone he would ever meet. We brought together four people to explore this relationship between Seamus Ennis and Cullum O'Quion and the fruits left by it for us today. Professor Emeritus of Irish Folklore in UCD and former director of the National Folklore Collection, Rianach Eogan's research interests were, and still are, primarily related to traditional song in Irish. She has also published and lectured widely on other areas of folklore and is, of course, the editor in two languages of the Field Diaries of Seamus Ennis. Peter Brown began playing Irish music at the age of six under the watchful eyes of Leo Rosen, Willie Clancy and Seamus Ennis. After a number of years playing music professionally, Peter joined RTE Radio in the 1970s and remained there for over 40 years. He is an acknowledged expert on Irish music culture. Having grown up in a piping family, it is no wonder that Kieran Brown started playing at 10 years old, taking lessons initially from Joe Doyle and Mick O'Brien. A regular attendee at the Willie Clancy Summer School, Kieran has learned from Mickey Dunn, Sean Talty, Porig Keane, and Sean Gavin. He is an avid listener, not only to recordings of piping, but of all Irish music. Roisin El Softy remembers always being able to sing. In fact, it came so naturally as a child that she sang before learning to speak. Whether in her native Irish or in her second language English, listening to Roisin sing is a heartwarming experience and one feels thrilled and privileged in her performing presence. The Seamus Ennis Arts Centre is delighted to welcome you as we delve into that special relationship of care and respect between Seamus Ennis and Cullum O'Quion as we present Misha on Far Keol. Thanks very much for coming along, particularly with the weather being as it is, and it's the centenary of Seamus Ennis' birth, born May 1919, in Finglas, so in a strange way where he, his people came from Nall or Danall, and uh, he was in Finglas, so we're sort of in a sense halfway between, and that's why Seamus is being celebrated in all sorts of different ways. So we thank the Seamus Ennis Art Centre in the Nall, and also, as well, the Festival History and the people here in Swords Castle for helping us putting this show on. Seamus was a unique cultural figure in so many ways. He was a collector of folklore, a singer, a lilter, a whistle player. He was a fiddle player as well, but he wouldn't have made his, his reputation on that alone. A very good broadcaster in a strange way, ahead of his time, I actually think, when you hear some of the poems that he made. He was very good with language, with the Irish language, the different dialects, also some Scots Gaelic. He translated song and prose very well. He was a good stage entertainer. That, that was something about him. He was well able to engage with the crowd. But of course, as many of you, you will know, First and foremost, for most people, Seamus was a, an Illin Piper. And I don't think we will ever see again all of those things in one person. Or if we do, it would be astonishing to think we'd, we'd see them to the same standard. So you had just Seamus was 
a unique person and he was from a particular time, you know. So you could spend many afternoons like this talking about Seamus, but we're going to look at just one aspect. And even then you could spend many hours talking about Seamus's collecting. So what we really do is just look at the music and song that Seamus collected from one person, and you'll hear all about it, Colm O'Kian of Glinska and the engagement that Seamus had with him. So the first thing we're going to do since we're talking about Colm O'Kian is hear a recording from that time. And this is Colm singing a song called Johnny Shoga, which dates from the time of the famine in Ireland. Just to give you a sense of who it is we're actually going to be talking about and hearing about. <laughs> The Irish Folklore Commission, Commission Bailey Aaron, was founded in 1935, and its aims were to collect, uh, preserve, and disseminate the oral traditions of Ireland. These included, of course, the stories, songs, music, aspects of vernacular architecture, everything from riddles, rhymes, the unwritten history of Irish tradition. Seamus O'Dellarga was the first director of the Irish Folklore Commission. Uh, he was a man from County Antrim, and he had been deeply involved with the establishment of the Folklore of Ireland Society and Common Le Bailey de Aaron, which was started in 1926, which was reliant for the most part on voluntary workers. So when the Irish Folklore Commission was established then in 1935, it was government funded, it was formally structured, and it employed collectors of folklore. Its main office was in Dublin, initially in what is now the National Concert Hall in Earthford Terrace, upstairs there in the very top rooms. Uh, and then it moved to Stevens Green, to number 82 Stevens Green. In establishing the commission, Delargy was very much influenced by the Scandinavian methods of work. Uh, because they had already set up a, a folklore archive and they were very busy collecting folklore. And a man called Carl von Sidoff, who was the father of the actor Max von Sidoff, advised Seamus Odelarga about how to set about collecting. And the philosophy of the Irish Folklore Commission was very much influenced in this way. Von Sidoff recommended very strongly that people who were collecting folklore should be familiar with where they were collecting, but should collect not only the material itself, in other words, not just the stories and the songs, but the collectors should also document the lives of the people from whom they were collecting, to give a context to the material that was being collected. So initially, a number of full-time collectors were employed. People could actually apply for the job of a full-time collector. And people like Sean O'Hohey, uh, was working in Donegal from 1935 until he retired. He was aged 19 when he started collecting. And Joe Daly, Joseph O'Dolly, was working in County Kerry in Corcovina, and he collected material from people like Peg Sayers. Initially, the collectors were issued with pen and paper, but then full-time collectors were given uh, use of an Ediphone recording machine, which was a very heavy uh, mechanically driven machine. It was a clockwork machine and the recordings were made with um, wax cylinders placed uh, on this machine. So Seamus Ennis was to join uh, this group of collectors. The greatest repository of songs and tunes and their background in fact and fable I found in a little pocket of North Connemara 
on the south shore of this bay, the Bay of the Yellow Oyster Bank, Kuanabestiribui. It's a place known as Glinshke, clear water in English. This man's name is Colomo Kuyan, and I wrote 212 items straight from his memory. <laughs> So here's a song that I know that Colum sang uh, on multiple occasions. And I ha I'm happy to say that I've got two different recordings of him singing, one kind of uh, with the crowd and one on his own. <clears throat> and it's always, it's always good to get uh, various different recordings of the same singer because you'll never sing it the same way twice. And um, it's Ban Fáidín and there's full of... Um, well, it was kind of fatal attraction before, before uh, Glyn Close. And um, um, she's following him everywhere and wishing that his own wife would be dead. So um, I don't know why it's called Ban Fáidín, really, when it's all about Fáidín and getting rid of the wife. But um, it's full of lovely uh, place names in the sea and uh, everywhere you went was kind of in the boat because you got there faster. So um, Ban Fáidín. Shan through your nach mission, nach mission, shan through your nach mission, ban fighting. Shan through your nach mission, nach mission, son man, a toy give a call. Oh, rah and good guy, you good guy, you good rah and good guy, you let fighting. Oh, rah and good guy, you good guy, you good, you can you while it's a modelish. Shan through your nach mission, nach mission, shan through your nach mission, ban fighting. Shan through your nach mission, nach mission, son man, a toy give a call. Oh, rah and she share to the rushing is you can you near but a tolly. Shan through your nach mission, nach mission, shan through your nach mission, ban fighting. Shan through your nach mission, nach mission, shan through your nach mission, ban fighting. Between 1935 and 1940, um, a number of full-time collectors were working for the Irish Folklore Commission with the emphasis for the most part on storytelling, on oral narrative. And within that um, section or type of, of folklore, the emphasis was on material in Irish because that kind of material was seen to be in the greatest danger of disappearing. Nonetheless, um, the Commission staff realised that the collection of music and song was of particular importance but they needed people with the necessary qualifications to transcribe the music and the song. In 1942 then, there was a, an opening with the Irish Folklore Commission and Seamus Ennis was ideally placed to be uh, employed. One of the tasks that Seamus faced when he began working with the Irish Folklore Commission as a type of training mechanism, I suppose, he was asked to transcribe materials that had been recorded in South Armagh by a priest called Father Luke Donnellan, who was known, I think, as the Mad Cured from Cross Maglen. But he had recorded songs on wax cylinder in the early 1900s. So Seamus Ennis was, was given training, if you like, uh, prepared for field work by transcribing uh, dozens of these songs that Father Donnellan had collected. So having completed these transcriptions, he was prepared then to undertake field work and he started making forays to different parts of Ireland, mostly to the west of Ireland. 
In the five years that he worked for the Irish Folklore Commission between 1942 and 1947, he, his, he was based in Dublin, his office was in Dublin, but he used to spend long periods of time, number of weeks, sometimes a number of months, in different parts of Ireland. He would go to Connemara, to Donegal, to Mayo, to County Clare, to Kerry, to Cork, uh, mostly to the west, but uh, to other places as well. One island I used to borrow a boat and row out to it, Fenish Island, and that was a proper hive of songs. The family there called McDonough, Shawneen Khalimi Makunaha, and his daughter Mara, another daughter Maggie, another daughter Bree, and his son Colum, Colleen, and he himself had a terrific fund of songs. I asked this man on the island, where was Shawnee Hollyman McDonald's house? And he said, that's it over there, the one with the two chimneys. And he walked along with me and came in the door with me and then welcomed me, disclosed his own identity that he was the man I was looking for. And one of the duties that he had, as was mentioned earlier, was to write a diary every single day that he was uh, on field work. In the diary, I think we get to know his approach to collecting. We get to understand maybe some of the challenges that faced a full-time collector of music and song. Um, as he cycled from place to place, it was during the war years and supplies they were scarce at times. So he, he had many difficulties. The weather was bad, that's described in the diary in many, many days, Drochla. So he wrote the diary in Irish for the most part, uh, and he tended to write in the dialect of the area in which he was staying. And one excerpt from the diary, the 20th of August, 1942, I translate. He says, this morning on my way again to Alnebron, he's in Connemara. He says, I met Sean Branagh, the land supervisor, and Tommy Clancy in a car. We stopped, lit our pipes, and talked. Sean invited me to spend the day traveling with him. I could inquire about music in each house he would visit in the course of his work. I went along from Loch Conneher to Recess. We visited about six houses. I got nothing. We got the names of some singers. I got the name then of an old woman from Tommy Clancy, Mrs. John Folan, do you hear? Three miles west of Corner, who keens at funerals and other occasions. And the name of another person who has songs, Coleman Keen, Glinch, north of Corner, home at 9.15 and a meal. The night has flown. It will be difficult to visit all these people. So that's our first mention of Colm O'Quillian. And besides all the songs which, which Seamus collected from Colm O'Quillian, there's also some very fine tunes as well because he was a lilter and also a, a melodian player. We're going to hear that later. And as Rina says, it was painstaking work, not, work, not just the collecting, but then the, the noting down of it. And I think Seamus, when he was learning piping, his father, rather than be constantly teaching him music, apparently showed him how to do staff notation and then gave him O'Neill's book and said, away you go and maybe don't be bothering me again. And then Seamus, prior to going to the Folklore Commission, he worked in a place called the Three Candles Press in Aston Quay, which was owned by a family friend, Colm O'Loughlin. At the sign of the Three Candles, printers and publishers in Fleet Street, Dublin, I learned more and more about music and song from Colm O'Loughlin, now gone to his reward. He taught me how to write the tunes of the slow songs so well that when I'd hear a song sung, I'd automatically visualize it on paper. So we had a look through the manuscripts uh, that, that are from that time that James wrote from Colum and made a couple of selections. And when looking at them, 
you can get a sense that the style of the music is very much about dancing. And I'd say dancing was very, very important at that time. Just the, the, the rhythm and, the, and the, the way the tunes are written. So Kieran is going to play a selection of three jigs. Now, we don't have titles for the first or the last one. The middle one is a version of The Lark in the Morning. And that's one thing you noticed. There's a couple of the tunes which would be tunes which we'd play, but very different versions. And, and that kind of makes them uh, valuable and unusual to hear. And what we can probably say is that since the time of Seamus, uh, writing these down, this may be the first time now in, in just our time here that these have been played again. Although Seamus Ennis had heard of Colm O'Keon in 1942, he didn't actually meet him until 1943. And his diary entry for Tuesday the 25th of May 1943, he wrote, I went to Glinch with Michaeline Cholomain a colon, a fiddle player. Colm of Locke, that was Colm O'Keon's nickname. Colm of Locke was expecting us, as Michaeline had sent him a message. We brought our musical instruments along, we were made very welcome, and we played music, danced, and sang. Column sang songs and lilted tunes and danced as well. An individual dance is called a breakdown in Connemara. We spent the evening egging Column on and I discovered that he has a vast store of tunes and songs. The most interesting, intelligent and considerate man, gifted with the patience for my slow process at that time. We are still very fast friends and I can say the same of all those who survive, who gave me so willingly from their repertoires. You see, I spoke their language as they spoke. So Colm was a fisherman, farmer. He spent most of his life in Glinsk, uh, northwest of Corna. Um, and he had a, an incredible zest for life, is I think how I would describe it, a great sense of fun. He had a vast store of songs, many of which he learned from his father, but he had a great deal of other material as well. And when he and Ennis met, they got on famously, as Seamus Ennis described it uh, on one occasion. Apparently, the initial meeting, Colm played or sang a, a very difficult song. I think it was actually Port in the Gibbaga that you see on the screen behind us here. Um, and he was testing the young Seamus Ennis, who was only 23 or 24 at the time. And he was very impressed when Ennis was able to play the tune back for him on the tin whistle. <laughs> Grammatically, a skill or on a skill coil way. I was doing so column, 
Mardur çelim de yiyesin. Dün size e, kan istikra hilse <gülüyor> yokuşleşkiriyor. <gülüyor> Ağız... <gülüyor> e, nöre... Vinyada o kadar, eks nöre kasmen portları işte o onba apıyor. Reşo <gülüyor> maşkiriyor. Well, anşin... Koşa egin rodi bu dökra naşin. Ağız dur çelim de yiyesin. E, Mardi gireyrilim insiskrutu hukşayarım. Ağız sikhet kanı halim hüktu gümün için grama hırışı taygız da onul. Sikhet kanı, portnı gibi oy. Abre şinin iş. Puram dedim lelel, so we can get a sense, I think, of the collecting situation here, where you see Colum O'Quion to the left and Seamus Ennis writing down literally in the field, on fieldwork, and he has pen and paper. And the great challenge, of course, was when Colum was singing that Seamus Ennis had to write the staff notation of the song, the words of the song, the ornamentation in the music, and then marry them all together and reproduce them on, on paper. Because Seamus Ennis didn't have an ediphone machine like the other full-time collectors, so he was dependent on collectors who might be in the area who could lend him uh, an ediphone machine. But when Colum was introduced to the Edifo machine, Ennis managed to, to borrow one from a collector called Liam Kushsler, who was collecting in the area at the time. Um, and he brought the Edifo machine to Colum, and Colum was amazed at this. And I think we can only imagine the effect of sound recording, listening back to your own voice, must have had on Colum at the time. Because he wouldn't have had the opportunity before that of hearing his own voice. So he was very impressed with the Ediphone machine. Initially, he was slightly scared of it, and he felt that it maybe didn't do justice to his voice in some way, but eventually he became accustomed to it. He affectionately called the Ediphone and Shannar, the old man, um, and was puzzled as to why and Shannar wasn't uh, reproducing the sounds that he uh, gave to and Shannar. And he composed a song uh, about the Ediphone as well. And Ennis also composed a song about Column. So they had a great deal in common. They were um, singers, musicians, uh, dancers, storytellers, and this great sense of fun, and uh, able to compose songs as well. The words of the first verse would be dictated to you. You'd write them onto the staff line, the staff notes, the stave. And then sing the verse. and you'd get the first line down and the third line down. And sing the verse again, you'd get the second line down and the fourth line down. And then sing it again, you could check on what you had done. Maybe over and over to get uh, intricacies and ornamentations correctly down. This now is a song that actually uh, Colm sang, sort of composed, I suppose, maybe on the spot, uh, to, to greet Seamus. This is a, another light-hearted song, 
And um, again, it's full of boating. And I believe it was composed by two grandmothers as they watched their grandsons playing. Um, they had uh, limpet shells that they turned upside down, if you're familiar with the kind of triangular little uh, shells. And they were using them as boats and they were racing them across the water and one one grandmother uh, says that her son, grandson is the superior boatsman and the uh, song goes on like that but the refrain seems to be with the lassie saying alas her fantastic boatsman has only gone and um, um, shipwrecked his boat his boat is wrecked and now um, she'll be waiting a very long time for him to come home and for the two of them to get married it's called Calhoun Fian <clears throat> Gain <laughs> Ta kapul is kar, ta kapul is kar, ta kapul is kar in ayele mi. Ta kapul is kar, ta kapul is kar. E girekle spanchu dum kelo kinfiyan. Na khafado emshira, na khafado emshira, na khafado emshira mu kelo kinfiyan. Na khafado emshira son klochan e nire skushole dinira mu kelo kinfiyan. Oh, master boys, worry, oh, master boys, worry, oh, master boys, worry, my home machine green. Nihran shan small, I bring shan scold, it's not in trophies more, the yellow hiddish. It's not a fado, I'm sure, and a fado, I'm sure, and a fado, I'm sure, and my yellow in fiam. Nah fado, I'm sure, as on Lohan, and yer as we shall let in yer, and my yellow in fiam. Ectunskarzamore, <laughs> She points in the heart, she points in the heart, she points in the heart, a hood clawed in a thief. She points in the heart, she points in the heart, a good brick of shell, my he couldn't have a thing for him. Get a, a, 
a sense of the very close relationship and friendship that developed between Seamus Ennis and Colm O'Quillan uh, by looking at some of the excerpts from the diary. It emerges in the diary in a way that I think it doesn't emerge perhaps in the in the textual material, shall we say, in the words of the songs and so on, how, how close they were. Saturday the 26th of June 1943. A very warm, sunny day, went to Glinsk. I went out there at three o'clock, five miles. Colm's mother told me he was at the bog. I travelled a further mile and a half and found Colm, who welcomed me heartily. And this underlines how Seamus Ennis became almost part of the Oquian family. I think he used to go fishing and sailing and working with the farm, helping and saving the hay and so on. And he would visit throughout the year. So he saw the, the agricultural cycle and the fishing cycle of the year. Some significant quotations, I think, from the diary. Ennis wrote, She colum o'quion an fara smo than in lum ve gobberlech a casulum. Of all the people I have ever met, colum o'quion is the person I most enjoy working with. On another occasion, Ennis wrote about Colm, he made me very welcome and was delighted to see me again. I spent a long time talking to him. I wrote material down from him while he was cutting turf. I left him at 9.30. He told me he wouldn't be there tomorrow as he was going to an Ord war. Wednesday, the 4th of August, 1943, spent the day from 11 o'clock until 8 o'clock with Colm again. So a fair number of hours. I've not written his entire repertoire yet. He came to Corner with me. I bought him a few drinks, and while we were drinking, he thought of an old religious song. I wrote it from him. He then gave me a list of some of his songs that I have not yet written down. I said goodbye to him because I've decided to set off and travel north to Donegal tomorrow. I was very lonely leaving Colm, and he was lonely as well because we were very friendly with one another. I was sad leaving him, and I look forward no end to seeing him again. By December 1944, the depth of the friendship is evident in the diary. Ennis wrote, I said goodbye to them at six o'clock. This is to the O'Quion family and to Colm. Colm's mother was crying as I was leaving, and Colm wasn't far off it. I was sad because I'm so fond of Colm. Neil Moran Fair is Tishkini is Sportula, not a smo, a may kind is grand simulagaha and lay omlanige non Colum Kena. Few men could compare to Colum as regards understanding, sport, conversation, and fun for the entire day. And we can just imagine how they spent the, the evenings um, having fun, telling stories, uh, writing down songs, um, and almost having singing competitions. My father's servant maid on board a big coal boat. She nearly wore her fingers off to feed Pat Murphy's goat. But the goat took ill that very night and died three days before. And it's now I'm winding up my song and I sing to you no more. Tobacco pipes, tobacco pipes, tobacco pipes and porter. You'll maybe sing a longer song, but I'm damned if you sing one shorter. And Cullum looked forward no end to welcoming Ennis back to Corna and to the Glinsk area again. So much so that at one point he said he was tempted to try and persuade Seamus Ennis to buy a house in Corna and stay there. And we, we mentioned earlier that besides the songs, he was also a melodian player and a lilter. And this is just a couple of short recordings of Colum. He, he plays on the melodian first a tune called Key Row, and after that, then he lilts a reel called The Mountain Top. Thank <laughs> you. 
Tony McMahon produced the long note. Tony was always very faithful to Seamus. He, he knew Seamus, he learned music from him and respected him, but also an important thing at the time, gave him work or employed him to do different things on the programme. And, and uh, one of the things he asked him to do for the long note was, was to prepare short little speech introductions to a tune and then play the tune. It's quite an imaginative thing rather than someone just playing the tune. So on Seamus then, this gave him an opportunity to show his talent for scripting and for radio presentation and you get a sense in this you, you just hearing this you you get the sense he, he knew his way around the script and he knew it how to bring it out on radio but it also involves a bit of talk about his time collecting what's what's described in the in the in the diaries and in Reynolds book so he introduces a tune called the Friars Bridges on this at times during my push bike days I was obliged to leave my machine at the house of friendly friendly people and borrowed their oars and thole pins to row their boat, they also let me have, out to Fenish Island in my searching for song and ditty and tune at that time in Connemara. My goal was the house of people named McDonough, the two chimneyed house of Shawnee Hollywood, where songs and tunes, lilts and lore abounded, as did food and tea, fortune telling from cards and tea leaves, and a pleasant content in welcome. My sole discomfort was watching time and tide to ensure the return of my borrowed boat before ebb tide, and I often made it in the dark too. From all that abundance I am picking on one now which surprised me in that it was the basic origin of a big piper's G, the phrase bridges. Developed from this old original, two-part theme into a six-part piping challenge to the best of us by some piper whose identity is now lost in oblivion. Of course, it was some time later when I finally became aware of this, and it was a long time earlier when my father, I recall, introduced the same jig and title, I buried my wife and danced on top of her. With his discernment, he found afterwards that this constituted merely a noxious fragment of an old current to the tune. I buried my wife and danced on top of her and found the Fry's Bridges was the correct name for it. But to revert to Finnish, that's what they sang for me there, this way. And I took the liberty of translating this for the edification of some people in my travels who didn't know the language. Who is that there that's knocking the ditches down? Who is that there that's knocking the ditches down? Who is that there that's knocking the ditches down? Nobody only Conla. Conla dear, don't come any near me. Conla dear, don't come any near me. Conla dear, don't come any near me. Maybe I shouldn't say Conla. It continues with who is tapping at the window pane, who is kindling the fire for me, who is pulling the blanket from over me. And anyone who tells you it was he translated it, don't believe half the lies he tells you. That's for the record, in contradiction of a certain fool who claims the credit. Anyway, here are that old time piper's phrase breaches. Thank you. 
So between 1943 and 1945, um, Cullum used to look forward no end to visits by, from Seamus Ennis, collecting visits, because he knew that there would be music and song and dance uh, and late hours and time gamadin and everybody, the neighbours would gather in and they'd have great fun. And Cullum said that he initially tried to hold back some of the material, not to give Seamus Ennis everything, his entire repertoire initially, so that he could keep Ennis coming to visit again and again and again. And one little anecdote I think illustrates this very well, uh, that Ennis wrote from Cullum, he just called it Fiecal and Hjol, or the music tooth. And apparently Cullum O'Quillan had a terrible toothache for uh, an entire week, and eventually he lost the tooth. And he was very concerned that the tooth he lost might be the one that was the music tooth and that he mightn't have any music after losing this tooth. So he said that he went out and he was watching to see if Seamus Ennis would come with his Ediphone recording machine to uh, record some music for him. And he was very grateful when Ennis arrived, made the recording, and he realised that he, it wasn't the music tooth that he had lost after all. So the scope and extent and value of the collection uh, I think it's very difficult to describe in relation to Colm O'Quillan. Very few people gave the amount of material that Colm gave um, to the Folklore Commission, to James Ennis. I don't think this would have happened if the friendship hadn't developed to the same extent. It was a very deep friendship indeed. I think we're very fortunate that the two of them met, um, that they got on so well and that they had this exchange. I think Colm's legacy is very difficult to assess at the moment. It's wonderful to hear the tunes being played that may not have been played for so long and to hear the songs being sung, but perhaps it's only in years to come um, that we'll be able to assess his, his legacy. It's very important, I think, the collection from Colm O'Quee, and it underlines how crucial it is and how essential it is to keep gathering, to keep documenting um, tradition, oral tradition. And I think we could remember as well that Colm well, came, he lived at a time before Joe Heaney, before the idea of performance in public, if you like, and the stage performance took place very much. He was very much a singer at the heart uh, and within the, the family circle and within the circle of the community. So I think we're very privileged to have this material and I don't think we would have it if it weren't for the work of Seamus Ennis and the generosity of spirit of Colm O'Quillan. Kailin Farulfian 
So it is Seamus' centenary and his work continues on outwards. People play the music that he collected in far off places as well as here and they may not know that it, it was due to Seamus' work that they're playing those tunes or singing those songs and he preserved them. It shows the value of the sort of work that was done 70 years ago. Did, did they plan that 70 years ago? But it came good, I think they did. A couple of things about Seamus, he did have exquisite taste. You know, taste is a personal thing but I could never ever think of anything that Seamus either played or sung or in his collection that you would say that, he, that, that wasn't in, in good taste. And when he was collecting, the people from whom he was collecting, they knew that he knew what was good. So they wanted to please him, but also, in a way, they also knew that, that they couldn't pass anything off to him. It was just the, the perfect meeting in that way. Uh, and also, he had the gift of what I've heard described as total recall. He could hear something sung or played and years later reproduced it. And even when he was working for the BBC, which he did after his, his the sequence of his work was to work for, for Colin Malachlan of the Three Candles Press, then five years, um, 42 to 47 of the Falkland Commission, four years in Radio Aaron where he was doing not music collection, but just general pop documentaries, news, everything like that. And 51 to 59, he worked for the BBC and they had the programme as I roved out. And they, those were his four sort of periods of work. After that, until his death in 1982, he was just performing and going around giving lectures and so forth, and ultimately living in a mobile home in the Nall, which again, as you well know, not, not far from here. Um, so pipers today listen to his playing, even at this stage, they learn his tunes, they look at his technique. So Kieran is just going to play a couple of reels that were very much associated with Seamus. He, he'll tell you himself what they are. Thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned, Seamus, massive influence still. Me and anyone else of my age be always listen to James' piping. These are two tunes that I got from his playing. The first one was actually composed by his father. Uh, he used to hear the thrush in the morning, the bird sing uh, what he believed to be this tune, and he wrote this tune, which is inspired by that. It's called the, the, the Morning Thrush. And then the second one is uh, the Salamanca. So, thanks very much. 